hello everyone. Welcome to this video on biostrategic fee. So a few people have asked that I provide a video of the um, lecture slides that I'm actually giving in the practical sessions on biostrategic fee. So that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm recording a video for you, just um, repeating those lecture slides for you. For example, if you had to miss the practical. I'm recording this from a, a stormy and actually slightly snowy Manchester. So it feels kind of um, a very, very seasonal. I should probably be doing my Christmas shopping. Hmm. But I'm not, so here we go. Let's talk about biostrategic fee instead. So, diving right in, it's always worth defining our terms. Biostrategic fee is a branch of stratigraphy that involves the use of fossil organisms in the dating and the correlation of the stratigraphic sequences of rock in which they are discovered. A zone is the fundamental division recognized by biostratigraphers. So basically, biostratigraphy is organizing sedimentary successions based on biological events and the evidence of those that are recorded in the rock record. Uh, this works because fossils allow us to correlate and date rocks. And that's really important actually because rock units from the same period may comprise many different rock types and end up being very geographically separate. I say, should say, I suppose, geographically separated. But the fossils found within them can be used to correlate them as long as those fossils aren't impacted by the um, environment of deposition, say. So as a, as a hopefully meaningful example of this, on this image, we've got some Triassic amyloids shown on the left-hand side here. And these have been used to build up a local sequence. That's this diagram here in the middle here in which we can say that, for example, this species um, appears at the same time as this species, but dies out sooner. This species continues. And then you can see that a series of different species of ammonoids um, evolve and then eventually become extinct over the course of one series of rocks in one part of the world. This is actually, um, oh, this is a global Triassic amyloid biostratigraphy. So you can see the paper that I used to build this up in this reference here. What you can also see here is that these have been um, compared to deposits globally and using other schemes of biostratigraphy, such as the conodonts, shown on the right hand side here, to create a broad global picture of the biostratigraphy of the Triassic period. And that's what's shown on the right hand side here. You can see there are, there are schemes here from Canada, the Western US, the Himalayas, China, and Siberia. So by doing this, um, this what well, is in fact a fairly simple process, we can build up this kind of picture of the different species that were alive throughout the Triassic or throughout other time periods, if we so wish. But this is relying on a number of underlying assumptions. All of those assumptions are required to be true to make biostrategraphy variable. So, variable, sorry, viable. So the a key, um, assumption here is that each species has its own unique geological range. In other words, we have to believe that one species has um, lived for a finite time. They species do not evolve twice and extinction is permanent. So for our example, drawing on the ammonoids again, we recognize ammonoid species by their suture lines. We learn, we'll learn about these or have learned about them depending on which order you're doing the videos for this course in or whether you came to lecture the course, by their suture lines. So, and each one of those we assume has lived for a short time in the Triassic. So that works really well with these, these particular species. We can do that on a, a broader scale as well. So for example, this is a group of arachnids, they're really cool that are called the um, Trignotarbids. We know that those were alive from the Silurian. They are amongst the earliest known fossils of organisms that lived on land. All of, well, I say organisms, I suppose I mean uh, animals that lived on land. These are amongst the first known land animals. And we know that they died out at the end of the Permian period. So even though this isn't a species, if we find a fossil of a Trignotarbid in a rock, we can say that that rock must date from the Paleozoic. So, I mean, I suppose that's quite useful. But we have to be aware of a thing called Lazarus taxon. I've defined this for you on this slide here. A Lazarus taxon is a taxon that disappears from the fossil record close to an extinction horizon, but reappears again much later in the sequence. This term refers to the story in the 
Christian uh, biblical gospel of um, John, in which Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. So it's a, it's a biblical allegory. Some examples of Lazarus taxa are shown here. So we've got the uh, the rice nullids. These are a weird group of arachnids, um, one of which is shown on the left-hand side here. Basically, I just chose this because I think these creatures are really cool. They're kind of weird, but kind of neat. Um, they were actually first described as 300 million year old fossils by a dude called William Buckland in 1837. One of his descriptions or his, um, his images associated with the descriptions are shown in the middle here. And this is the rice nuliid. Interestingly, that's a trigonotarbid, just in case you wanted to know. Um, that's the group of arachnids on the last slide. But this is a rice nuliid, and it was first described from a 300 million year old fossil in 1837. The first living species of um, rice nuliid was described the, a year later in, um, uh, based on a species that was found in West Africa by Felix Edouard Gouin Monneville. Apologies for my French pronunciation there. So for, for a year there, we thought that this was a group that had gone extinct 300 million years ago before people realized that they were still alive today. The really classic example of this is this smiley chappy here on the right. This is a celiacanth. This is a family of fish that um, are related to lungfish and indeed to tetrapods, that's fish with limbs like us, um, that were believed to have gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period until one was found by fishermen, I think off Indonesia in the 18, sorry, 1930s. So a really good example there of a Lazarus taxon. So that was assumption number one, this assumption about species um, appearing, then going extinct and not reappearing. Assumption number two is that rocks in which fossils of a species are contained should have been deposited at the actual time that species existed. That may, uh, you know, as, a, as an initial thought, that may make sense, right? But then we've got to consider things like sediment reworking. What happens if a fossil is um, eroded out of one rock? and then deposited in another. Well, that is a possibility. So we have to look out for signs of that. Um, so signs that our assumption number two is actually um, correct. Thankfully, you can often tell sediment reworking. It's often obvious due to abrasion, wear, and disarticulation of the, um, of the fossils in question. But we have to be careful about this because, for example, if we, we are talking about fossil shark teeth, such as those shown on the left hand side here, all of these are pristine, nice examples. But um, shark's teeth can be um, kind of rolled around on a beach uh, for increasing uh, amounts of time. And when that occurs, even though these may be deposited in a rock at the end of that, if, say, we're looking at a beach deposit, we have to bear in mind that abrasion and wear may respect, reflect those processes and not necessarily reworking of sediment. So we have to be um, very careful that this assumption is true and we have to try and make that assessment on the basis of the evidence that we can see in the rock. Nevertheless, that is assumption number two, which is most of the time true, that a, uh, if a species is deposited in a rock, that species was alive at the time the rock was deposited. Let's move on to um, assumption number three. Assumption number three is that the principle of formal succession um, is correct. So formal succession um, is defined on the slide for you here. This is the principle first recognized at the beginning of the 19th century by William Smith, this uh, fine cravatted chap on the left here, that different strata each contain particular assemblages of fossils by which the rocks may be identified and correlated over long distances, and that these fossil forms succeed one another in a definite and habitual order. So basically, this is stating that the fossil record um, is an accurate record of the process of evolution. And if evolution is not occurring, then we have a problem here. A problem, right? This wouldn't work if evolution didn't occur, but then evolution occurs, so it's all good. So this guy on the chap, William Smith, is actually a really interesting gentleman. Um, unlike many scientists of his era, he was around in the mid to late 1700s, he was a working man. He wasn't a member of the aristocracy, and I find him very interesting as a result of that. He was actually a canal uh, builder. He was in charge of building canals across the UK, which was happening like crazy at this point in the Industrial Revolution. 
and through his work he spent a lot of time digging up different rocks and he was one of the first people to recognize that actually throughout different parts of a country such as the UK in his case um, you can even if rocks are very different in their nature say limestones versus sandstones the fossils in them reflect very well the time they were deposited in so that all works very well and I uh, my example here is actually drawn from the world of trilobites there are a series of predictable changes in the makeup of different trilobite groups through time as we go from their origins in the Cambrian through to their eventual distinct its distinction extinction in the Permian period so that's really um, a, that is a key assumption that's assumption number three but we need to be cautious about this one too because we need to bear in mind that the fossils that appear in a rock could be due to changes for example in ecological tolerance rather than um, the evolution of the um, the fauna involved or due to changes in the environment that the rocks were deposited in because um, not all uh, organisms live in, the, in every environment or they could be due for example to migration so again with this assumption we have to think about this in terms of the evidence that we can see in the rock so when it comes to actually functionally doing um, biostrigraphy what should we consider well uh, here you can see an image that I'm going to be returning to quite a lot over the coming slides. This is an example of some Silurian um, uh, biostratigraphic units. So these are Silurian in age and they're based on um, graptolites. These are images, of, these are fossils which you can see in the images on the right hand side here. They're, um, they are um, interesting organisms that you can learn about in the, the videos or lectures on graptoloids. So that's, that's all good. And what you can see here in the middle is a range diagram. So each one of these black lines represents the range uh, uh, along which a particular species of graptoloids was alive. So where the black line starts, that's when they first appear, and where the black line ends, that's where they go extinct. And each one of these in, the, um, in this diagram is one of our fundamental units of biostratigraphy. So the, these are called the biosomes, and that's our fundamental unit. So the, one of these units is defined as comprising rocks that are characterized by the occurrence of one or more specified kinds of fossil, known as an index or a zone fossil. So when you find a zone fossil in a rock, you can say that that rock is a member of the zone defined by that fossils, by that fossil, sorry. Biozones, these units, often represent um, changes in faunal diversity in a particular area. And you can build these up to very um, big scale zones if you so wish. So worldwide, we would call these biozones, and regionally, we would call these uh, subzones. So I suppose I, that was a bit unclear, I apologize. Um, if we want to do this on a worldwide scale, we call these biozones, and on a regional scale, we call these zones. Okay, so basically it's just differences in um, spatial scale there. The temporal resolution of zones uh, depends upon the rates of evolution, uh, the rates of extinction, the amount of rock accumulation over a given time period, and the sample spacing. Bear in mind that um, we have different kind of categories of these, these units in terms of their temporal range and regional or global, more profound biostratic, biostratigraphic boundaries are often called stages or series. So our zones are the kind of um, the fundamental unit and then zones are put together into stages and stages are put together into series, okay? So that is our fundamental unit, the biozone. That's a unit of rock that's defined by the appearance of a fossil. Fossils that characterize and give their names to a particular biozone are called zonal index fossils. I've already mentioned this. And index fossils are key to biostratigraphy, so I'm going to go over this for you in painful, excruciating detail. Let's go back to our example and let's look at one particular species. Let's look at Oct Octavites spiralis, which is this one shown on the image in the middle here. This gives its name to a zone, the O spiralis zone. And that zone is defined as the time period during which O spiralis existed, 
all good, fairly simple, right? So bear in mind uh, that uh, this Osborales zone is shown here, this is a single biozone, and it's shown in a graptolite scheme here. And actually, there are multiple index fossils in different parts of the tree of life for Silurian zones, as well as graptolites. We have zones based on conodonts, chitinozoans, spores, and indeed vertebrates. And we can use all of these together um, to define a particular um, time period that in our case, our Osporalis zone is about 300, uh, sorry, 300, 436 million years old. So I, I first introduced the idea of biostrigraphy just after our mollusk lecture, hence me choosing um, mollusks to demonstrate one of the key things I wanted to talk about with regards to biozones. So I'm talking about cephalopods within this, um, within this example because it linked up to the lecture, but the same is true of, of any set of zone fossils. Um, so uh, cephalopods are really good for Mesozoic biostrigraphy um, and ammonoids are key fossils within, within the, the cephalopods for doing this. Um, but what I want to explain now is essentially using those, what makes a good zone fossil? So just remember, a zone is named after uh, an index fossil. And there are a number of things that make a good index fossil. So for example, we would want a zone fossil to have a short time range. We would want it to evolve fairly rapidly. Um, from the Cretaceous to recent, there are about 70 biozones for what it's worth, mostly based on microfossils with an average duration of around 2 million years per biozone. Um, in the lower Paleozoic, so in older rocks, that's normally divided um, based on conodont, conodont biozones. We'll learn about those in our microfossils lecture. And there are about 39 of those with an average duration of 3 million years. Here's a really nice example shown here of why ammonites are really cool. These are Cretaceous zones based upon ammonites. And you can see on this scale here that actually our, our zones in ammonites in the late Mesozoic get down to about 1 million years in terms of their temporal resolution. So that's really super neat. So that's number one of what makes a good index fossil. Number two, of what makes a good index fossil, is that they should have a distinct morphology, which makes them easy to identify. This is true of ammonites due to their beautiful structure, um, suture structures, which you can see in this image here, based actually in this case on a CT scan. So the fact that um, ammonites in particular have these really recognizable and easy to, to recognize um, Sutralide makes them a good zone fossil. Number three of what makes a good zone fossil is that they should have these organisms a wide geographic distribution. It's no good if our animals are living in a single basin at some point in the world. Ideally, we would want them to be present in all of the oceans um, of a particular time period if we're talking about, for example, marine rocks. So this does vary with applications. Some basins in particular, and ones that people, for example, look for resources in, have their own biostratigraphy. But many other questions do require this global distribu distribution. Um, if, for example, we want to understand global shifts in climate. So a good example of how widespread um, these uh, our ammonoids are is shown on this map here and you can see that actually um, in rocks deposited all over uh, the uh, continent, supercontinent of Pangaea we get records of um, this particular group of ammonites. They're pelagic organisms, they swim around in oceans, they're deposited in rocks that we eventually find today and that makes them very very good as zone fossils. So I think that was number that was number four right? I'm going to assume that was number four and let's go on to number five. Ideally, um, a really good zone fossil should be facies independent. So that means that it shouldn't be strongly linked to the environment of deposition of a rock unit. That's often true of pelagic organisms such as cephalopods. This is actually a nautilus that's shown in this slide here. So what we want is for our zone fossil to appear in a wide range of litho lithologies and paleo-environmental settings. That doesn't, of course, mean there aren't biases in all index fossils, but ideally we should want them to, to be facies independent. And finally, number six, I think, we want our index fossils to be 
in of high abundance. We want lots of them to be around. This makes it more likely that we will find our index fossils and will make conducting a biostratigraphic analysis quicker and easier. Ammonites have a high preservation potential. So in these, this example, this is generally true. This is an example of a wave cut platform in um, Dorset. And each one of these little round circles here on this um, wave cut platform is in fact an ammonite. The rocks are absolutely packed full of these little dudes. So that is the final thing that we expect to be, um, to be uh, for, for a, a fossil um, to kind of the fire site. That is the final property of a fossil that will make them a really good zone fossil. I just wanted to add some words of caution here. This all seems simple because I'm giving you these nice examples, but I have several friends who do this for a living. And sometimes they look a bit like this chap being harassed by owls in this fantastic Goya picture. Um, and that's because biostratigraphy is actually really difficult, not because of the underlying principles that I've taught you, but because of the reality of doing a biostratigraphic analysis. The distribution of fossils in rocks is controlled both by their evolution so that's useful for biostratigraphy, but by also by their paleoecology. And that's often less useful um, for our purposes in biostratigraphy. That can be good for looking at the environment of deposition of a rock. But if we're only interested in time, paleoecology is not useful for us. So basically what I'm saying is that evolution gives us time and paleoecology gives us environment. And if we're doing an analysis that's based on time, we have to try and understand the paleoecology to then remove that influence from our analysis of time. And that's not always straightforward to do. Also, ultimately, often, because we're dealing with the fossil record, data is incomplete. So that makes, again, by strict feet in the real world, very, very difficult. And there's all kinds of realities to to, to this. So some fossil groups, for example, are more useful than others when it comes to biostratigraphy. Um, and so when it comes to doing a biostratigraphic uh, study, say, um, actually things can get really quite complex, even though it's built on these simple rules. So I spent the next um, few slides in the practical talking about how we can actually use fossils to correlate rocks. And I started by highlighting that, okay, we can sometimes do this in, if two, say, um, localities or boreholes are close to each other, we can correlate between those two by doing a thing called lithostratigraphy, by using the actual rock type to understand the differences between the two. So in this diagram, I've represented rock types by different colors in these two completely made up, obviously, stratigraphic sections. And we can say, for example, that, um, here I'm, I've got a black unit, a green unit, a white unit, an orange unit, and a gray unit. And if we can, um, if these these uh, different sites are fairly closely um, spaced out, we can make the assumption that maybe these changes in lithology represent the same underlying rock units, and therefore they may represent similar periods of time. And we can draw these lines between them joining up those changes in lithology. And that may allow us to say something about the rates of sedimentation, say. There's been, for example, if that assumption is true, there's been more green, green sedimentation in this um, locality than in this one here. So that's a really nice example of when it's easy to draw um, kind of uh, correlations between two different um, localities, but because they share the same uh, underlying rock units. That's an example when lithophages link between sections, in other words, but that's not always the case. So in this example here, um, you can see that uh, this orange unit here actually um, isn't found in our section number two on the right here. Rather, we seem to have uh, both the black and the green unit in both of these, then a white and a pink unit. And in these instances, it's a lot harder to draw lines that may represent a similar time between our fossil outcrops, our fossil outcrops, between our different sections. Thankfully, when we have fossils, this allows us to actually draw those lines despite the changes in lithological units. So you can see that now I've put a few fossil groups in each one of my rocks. I've put this fantastic trilobite there at the bottom. I've got an ammonite here, and I've got an echinoderm here at the top.
And actually, if we look at the section on the right hand side here, we can see that, okay, I've got this white and this pink unit, but in this white unit, this ammonite is found, same as that green unit. So these two must represent a similar age because this ammonite was presumably around in both places at the same time. That was one of our uh, fundamental underlying assumptions of biostigraphy. And then we see between the white and the pink unit that we go from having ammonites to having echinoderms. And that means that actually this white to pink lithostratigraphic boundary is the same one as this green to the orange one. And that allows us to draw a line between the two, even though they're different rock units, saying that these um, changes, these lithostratigraphic changes in units represent the same time, roughly. And that, because those that line represents uh, changes that represent the same time, is called an isochron. So an isochron, iso meaning same, chron meaning to do with age. And so the, what that allows us to really say here is that between this section and that section, we've had a thing called a pinch-in of this white unit. We've had a, uh, a an extra unit appear between those two sections. But because of the fossils, we can say how those line up in terms of time. Hence, the fossils tell us where isochrons go. We can also lose units, so that in this fine example, we've got an unconformity in the section on the right, as represented by this wavy line here. Um, and we've got, on the left, an extra white bed, which we don't see on the right. But because that white bed has our echinoderm in it, um, and the unconformity shows us a boundary that goes from echinoderm to ammonite, same as we've got an echinoderm to ammonite here, we can say that we've had a thing called a pinch out. This unconformity here represents um, the, the time period bet between which we got the evolution, uh, the extinction maybe, of this echinoderm and the evolution of this ammonite, and therefore we can draw our isochron from the top of the white bed down to our unconformity. That's a pinch out. This is all super simple, right? I'm giving you these really simplified example. So I just wanted to finish this particular set of slides by highlighting um, that actually in the real world, things are significantly uh, more complex than this. Using these same simple principles, you can create uh, similar sets of isochrons, such as that shown here, which is actually based on some uh, basins in New Zealand. And these simple principles can build up to actually show really, really complex sequences of zone fossils. So that's it for me for the first set of slides. I'm just gonna pause my video now and get a drink of water and then I'll continue into the next set of slides that I gave you in uh, the, the second practical uh, lecture bit on biostratigraphy. Okay, and so that brings us on to the second set of slides, biostratigraphy two from our, um, our second practical. So we've just covered what a biozone is. I don't remind, need to remind you of that because it's part of the same video. Um, so we're just going to be, for the rest of this video, thinking about local range biozones. This is a particular type of biozone that's shown on this diagram here. That is a, um, uh, you know, a range from the um, appearance to the extinction of a particular zone fossil. I just wanted to highlight to you before going on to talk about those that this is one of many kinds of different biozones which we can broadly split into two, two kind of like camps of biozones. The first are interval biozones and there are several types of these that are shown on the left here. The local range taxon or some sometimes called the taxon range biozone the range of occurrence is a single taxon, is just one of those. We've got other kinds which include the concurrent range biozone. So that is um, quite a commonly used one, which is the concurrent range of two different species. So um, the only um, kind of rocks that are, uh, are dated within that concurrent range biozone are those where both of those fossils are present. That has obvious problems unless the fossil record is very complete because you need you need to know for sure that the absence of one of those fossils is not just due to the fact that it didn't fossilize. So, you know, that's a weakness. There are also things called consecutive range biozones. So these are based on consecutive ranges of fossils that appear within a single evolving lineage. So when you have an evolving lineage of organisms, say microfossils that go through a known sequence of different species, then you can use the um, disappearance of one of those and the presence of another to create a consecutive range biozone. 
You can also do that with different species. So the, the interval between two successive last appearances of unrelated fossil species is called a successive last appearance zone. That's quite common for what it's worth in industries where um, fossils are recovered via drilling. So um, when uh, you're drilling um, through rocks, uh, the last appearance of a particular fossil is more reliable than the first appearance because sometimes fossils can fall down the hole, as it were, that you're drilling. You also have things called abundance or acme biozones, as shown on the, the bottom here, which are defined by the particular abundance of a certain species during a time or interval. That is subjective in nature, so one person's abundant may not be in others, um, and that limits the recognition um, and regional extent of these units. There are also <coughs> uh, things called assemblage biozones. These are um, generally unique associations of three or more species. Um, it's a concept that's often fairly uh, loosely applied, uh, but these are strongly dependent upon local ecology. Um, so they're more suitable for local or intrabasinal applications rather than global ones, but they are used, for example, in energy extraction industries quite a lot for that reason. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, as well a couple more terms. The first of these is the first appearance datum, as shown here on that slide, and this is the first occurrence in a section of a particular species, so that is the lowest stratigraphically. This represents the appearance and spread of a species from a location of isolation. So it can normally um, represents, rather than the evolution of that species, actually just the, the migration of that species into um, the particular place where we have a uh, where we have our um, site that we're interested in. We rarely catch the really the evolution of a species because of um, the fact that you can get downhole contamination when you're drilling boreholes. Um, these first appearance datum, these fads, are not used that frequently in situations where you're actually looking down boreholes. So in this example, I've marked on the first appearance datum of our O. spiralis species, um, which is the bottom of this um, of it, this line on the range deck graph. The lad is the last appearance of a, or last occurrence of a, sec a particular species of organism in a section. So this is the highest stratigraphically. So in our example here of O. spiralis, this is the end of its range line here on that, that range graph. This normally represents the extinction or the localized extinction of a species. Just FYI, the localized extinction of a species is a, is a thing called extirpation. This normally um, occurs at least the localized extinction, when a species is no longer able to adjust to shifting environmental conditions. Its numbers decrease and eventually uh, the species disappear, disappears. So we've got the fads and then we've got the lads. And we often present that on range charts, which I explained um, when we first met this slide. But that doesn't, uh, biostatistically doesn't end there. We can actually kind of quantify things slightly better. And in recent decades, um, we've moved in paleo, in paleontology and biostatistically towards trying to quantify this in approaches. Um, I'm just going into one over the course of this lecture series, or several. Um, and the one that I'm going to is a thing called graphical correlation. This uses the fads and the lads um, of a series of fossils between two sections plotted against each other so that one is on the x-axis of a graph and the other is on the y-axis. And those are generally measured from a specific point of known time, such as a recognizable marker bed, say. So uh, you can see an example of how we do that here. So we've got a series of fossils. We've got fossils 1 through 12 on our y-axis and 5 through 10 on the x-axis. And we can actually, for those um, fossils that are shared between the two, um, two localities, we can graph on, so this is fossil number five, the first appearance datum in terms of meters from that marker bed on the x-axis and site one, say, or outcrop B, I should say here, and the distance from that known uh, marker bed on outcrop A, and that creates a single point in our graph. If we do that with the last appearance datum in that same fossil, that creates another point on our graph. We can do this for all of the fossils that appear in both sites, 
And I would encourage you to think about these as just the fads and the lads are basically the, the same concept. They're a known point of time um, uh, in uh, the series of, uh, of um, rocks that have been deposited in both of these sections. So you've got a known point in time and all you're doing is plotting on the amount of sedimentation that has occurred since the first known point in time, the origin, and the that known point in time, which would be the fad or the lad. And these two are conceptually the same thing. We can then draw onto our graph a line of correlation. So um, this reflects relative sedimentation rates between the two sections that are being compared. So in this case, where they're roughly 45 degrees, that would indicate sedimentation um, or a sedimentation rate that was roughly the same at both localities. What then does it mean if the line is closer to one borehole than another on this graph? So in this case, borehole two, the line is closer to borehole two than it is to borehole number one. Well, that means per unit time in borehole one, we have more sedimentation in borehole two. So that means that borehole two has higher rates of sedimentation. And indeed, the gradient of this line would actually tell us how much more or how much faster sedimentation was in borehole one than two. What's going on here? Well, you can see at this particular, um, in this particular graph, we've got a straight line going upwards. And what this means is that in borehole one, we have no sedimentation, whilst in borehole two, the fads and the lads that would fall on this line are still being separated by sedimentation. So this is either a dis or an unconformity in borehole one relative to borehole two. So that's all very, very interesting. So through this approach, we can actually create a graph that shows allows us to quantify the difference between two particular localities. If we wanted to take this a step further, we could create a thing called a composite standard reference section. So what we can do is take multiple um, localities and start marking, um, transferring from one, uh, one of these sections onto this CSRS, all of the points from our locality. We can do that for multiple different localities to create this composite section. And then we can actually use points of known time, such as these ash beds, which can be radiometrically dated on this stratigraphic section to actually um, to stretch or, or, or um, compress that section to show genuine units of time. And that in turn allows us to, when we have a new stratigraphic section, just compare it to our composite standard reference section. So this can give us an indicator of actual sedimentation rate for any given column. It's really exact um, because we don't have the first or the last global appearance of any fossil, but it can be quite a useful tool in many different instances. And there's no way to do this using just the rocks themselves. That is only a thing that we can achieve through using our fossils and through using biostrigraphy. So that brings me to the end of the slides that I presented in our practicals um, over the course of uh, the last few weeks. I hope that's useful for you. If you have any questions, do of course ask me in one of our future sessions. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, otherwise, I will see you sometime soon. Take care.